Hey everybody, I wanted to give you your uh, introduction to the experiment that we're going to be doing this upcoming week. Um, we're going to be doing a Bradford assay. Now, a Bradford assay, a couple of things right off the bat. One, this is a technique that if you work in any life, right, the uh, life science research lab, any lab where you analyze proteins, you're absolutely going to do a Bradford assay. Um, this is maybe one of the more basic technologies or basic techniques that is done in any biochemistry lab. And the, the intent and the purpose of this is to determine the concentration of protein in a sample. Um, so the value of this is you can determine if your sample, like if you're, if you're analyzing uh, nucleic acids, DNA or RNA, you can determine if there's any protein contamination. In addition to that, you can determine how much protein contamination there is. If you're trying to eliminate all the protein in that mixture, well then, this is a great technique for you. Um, so this is a technique that, right off the bat, one of the cool things about it is that it utilizes the visible light spectrum. Um, and what you're going to do with this experiment is you're going to figure out what is the lambda max, or what is the highest wavelength that absorbs light um, for the sample. Now, this is, so the, the Bradford assay or the Bradford technique was developed back in the 1970s by this fellow right here, Marion M. Bradford, right there. Oh, no, I don't, that's just the, yeah, switch to annotate. So Marion M. Bradford, and basically what he did was he took this molecule right here, Kamasi blue, and um, there was research at the time that showed that this substance would react with proteins. And he mixed it in with um, ethanol, phosphoric acid, and, uh, or sorry, he mixed 95% ethanol, Kumasi blue G250, and phosphoric acid, and then added that to water to make this Kumasi solution. And this is a, a dark blue solution. It's very, very dark whenever you're looking at the, the bottle, the large volume of it. Um, and it is very light sensitive. So what this is going to do is it's going to absorb light within the visible light spectrum, as we as I previously mentioned. Now, the power of this technique ultimately came down to time. So being able to determine or analyze a sample and see whether or not there was protein in there in a matter of minutes was, it sounds cliche and kind of redundant, but um, it was a game changer. No longer would you have to do a technique that required concentrated strong acids or analyze through a, a, a gel analysis to determine whether or not you had protein in the sample. This was something that if you look at figure three here, it shows that there is a sample without any protein present on the far left. And as that protein concentration increases, well, then you have this brilliant blue solution. Now, the cool thing about this is when you look at these two samples right here, to me, they're kind of, uh, they're almost, they're virtually identical in terms of the, the blueness. I mean, I can tell a subtle difference, but if you ask me to quantitate that or quantify that, I don't think I'd be able to. I'd be able to say something like the the one on the left of the two that I've circled is 10% less blue than the one on the right. But, you know, my standard there is blueness. So I don't really have a quantifiable measure to compare there. Um, and so that leaves me with, well, there's less protein in this sample than in this sample. Now, with a spectrophotometer, with a visible light detection system, you can narrow down and you can basically develop a standard that there is this much protein in sample number one, there's this much protein in sample number two, this much in three, four, five, and six. And what that allows you to do is correlate the, just a second, absorbance and um, the amount of light that is absorbed and the protein content or protein concentration. So when we do this, when we correlate our absorbance and our protein concentration, then there's a very easy way to analyze an unknown sample. You can look at that unknown sample and say, oh, well, 
this unknown sample or this sample that has an unknown amount of protein absorb this much light. Oh, well, if it absorbed this much light, I can compare it to known standards um, that I put together and I can say, well, the absorbance of 10 micrograms per microliter is this and this unknown sample absorbs the exact same. Okay, well, then my protein concentration must be 10 micrograms per microliter. So that's the power of the Bradford technique and the Bradford assay. Now, the Bradford assay for context replaces some other techniques that were previously done. For instance, if you look on the right-hand side of this page, you'll see tryptophan and tyrosine. Those are two amino acids that one thing that they have in common is they both are ring structures. Tryptophan has that bicyclic ring structure, whereas tyrosine has that ring in that hydroxide group. So these are both um, aromatic compounds and aromatic rings, and they're going to absorb light. Well, they absorb light in the UV spectrum, in the ultraviolet range. They absorb light as, at approximately 260 nanometers, which is great because, well, if you have a UV spec, you can shine that light at these, or 280 nanometers, I'm sorry. Um, you can shine light at 280 nanometers at these samples and boom, they're going to absorb that light. So then you'd be able to say, well, the initial or the light that was shined at this sample was this, and the light that is you know, detected is this, okay, well, based on that, I can draw some correlation. I can say that there's this much protein based on the amount of light that was absorbed. That's good and well until you remember that, well, DNA and RNA, those both have uh, nitrogenous bases and those nitrogenous bases, they're gonna absorb light at approximately 260 nanometers. So the thing is that if something absorbs light at 260 nanometers, if you look at a, a spectrum, a UV light spectrum, imagine that it goes a little bit, I gotta move this here. It goes a little bit like this. So let's say that this right here is my 250 to uh, 260 in the middle here, and then 270. 280. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that if something absorbs light at 260, it's probably going to absorb a little bit of light at 280 nanometers. Now, with that said, you, if you're trying to see how much protein is in your sample, and you also see that, oh, well, you've got a lot of DNA and RNA in that sample, well, whatever result you get from the amount of protein that is in your sample is going to be um, influenced by the amount of DNA or RNA that's in that sample. So it might appear that you have some sort of contamination or some level of contamination um, when it's something that you, you just have to navigate around. You have to realize that you're, if you're measuring 280 nanometers and you're looking for just protein, well, some of that 280 nanometer absorbance might also be um, DNA. Now, that's not to say that measurements at 280 nanometers are like a waste of time or anything like that, but instead you have to account for that. So you do have this little calculation where you can, you know, plug in your 280 nanometer uh, absorbance versus your uh, 260 nanometer absorbance and say, okay, well, based on that, here is my, uh, here's the protein concentration. Um, but my point here is that the Bradford reagent or the Bradford assay, by comparison, you don't have to do that sort of calculation because DNA and RNA, one, they're not going to absorb light at 595 nanometers. Two, they're not going to require you to do any sort of calculation. So, and I just, yeah, so whenever you're doing the, um, yeah, so DNA is not going to interfere. So the Bradford technique kind of expedited this process where you don't have to worry about contamination, tells you, well, if there's this absorbance, there's that much protein. Um, so it was, it was definitely convenient, it was definitely a convenient um, change to the calculation. Okay, so what you're first going to do 
in this experiment, whenever you're working through this, is you have to figure out what wavelength is your lambda max. So what is the wavelength that gives you the um, highest absorbance level? Now, I'll give you a little bit of a spoiler that the wavelength is within the visible light spectrum. And so what you're going to do in order to figure this out is you are going to, where, where are we? You are going to put a solution together that consists of, it's on the next page here, sorry. Okay. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to get a cuvette. And in that cuvette, you are going to add um, 1,000 microliters of the Bradford reagent. Put that in there. And what you are going to do is you are going to do a full spectrum read. So what that's going to do is give you the entire wavelength or the entire visible light spectrum. So that's about uh, roughly 400 nanometers onto roughly 700 nanometers. And what you're going to get is basically something that shows you something like that where you see one peak that corresponds to a wavelength, and then you see another peak that corresponds to another kind of range of wavelengths. So this will tell you when that Bradford reagent it is in that cu cuvette alone, there is a certain amount of light that's absorbed by that solution. And you'll be able to figure out approximately those wavelengths, roughly where they are. Now that's basically part one of this, this portion. The next thing that you're going to do is you're going to get a cuvette and you're going to put 900 microliters of the Bradford reagent and 100 microliters of a stock protein solution. Now, you will notice that these two samples look fundamentally different. Um, the way that they will look different is it will look a little bit like this sample versus this sample. One of them is, is, is like a grayish red, and that's a strange combination, but one does not have much of a hue to it. The other one, the one with the protein in there, that's going to be a, a deep blue or a kind of a brilliant blue solution. Now, the one that's the brilliant blue solution, that is the one that has protein in it. And so what you're going to do with that is you're going to, again, do a full spectrum read. So you should see the same wavelength range let me show you all that approximately 400 ish to 700 ish and what's going to happen is our initial peaks look like this when we had no protein present but now when we add protein to this mixture well some of those wavelengths are going to change there's going to be a new wavelength that absorbs the most. And so what you will need to do for this is you will need to figure out which wavelength absorbs the uh, absorbs the most, which wavelength has the highest absorbance. That will be the necessary wavelength that you're going to need for part two. And part two is the actual preparation of the standard curve. This is where you are going to first figure out what's the optimal time to mix your protein and your Bradford reagent together. Do you let it incubate for two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes? How long do you let that sit? And does that absorbance change over time? A little bit of a spoiler, you do not have to wait 20 minutes. What I would recommend is go with zero minutes, one minutes, two minutes, and five minutes. And what I mean by that is you're gonna put the Bradford reagent into the cuvette. You're gonna add 100 microliters of protein. You're going to mix those by pipetting. Mix, 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 mix. Then you are going to place it into the 
um, visible light spectrophotometer, and you're going to take a reading. Let's say that this is 0 0.555. 0 0.555. Okay, so that absorbs light 0.555. Then you let it incubate for a minute. And maybe what you'll see is this go up to 0 0.610. Let it incubate for two minutes. Maybe it'll go up to 0 0.618. And then after five minutes, maybe it drops back down to 0 0.610. Now, what I want you to think about this is, or the way that I want you to kind of think about this is uh, the cost-benefit analysis and the time differential. Like, if we prep that sample and immediately put it into the, the light box, and we get an absorbance of 0.555, then we wait a minute and it goes up to 0 0.610. That's a pretty stark difference. That's almost 10% difference. If you let it sit for two minutes, the difference between one and two minutes, 0 0.008. So we're talking about something in like a, a single digit percentile difference. And then after waiting for five minutes, it drops back down a little bit. It's worth noting, it's important to recognize that these changes, they're somewhat minor at, at some time frame, at some point in time. And that's what I want you to figure out. Like, what is the, the best amount of time where you get basically some sort of stabilization in that number? Um, so your intent and your purpose here is to figure out how long do I need this sample to incubate before I can basically discard it? Um, and how long until it's kind of matured enough to get a, a good, reliable reading? Okay, so once you have that, once you kind of have like an idea of, okay, I'm gonna let it incubate for two minutes each time, keep that number in your mind, two minutes. That's the optimal time that you're going to do. Then after that, you're going to put together a data set. Now, what the intent here is, and what the purpose here is, and the way that I, I recommend filling out this table, is you will be given a stock. And this is just like when you're doing your practical, practical final exam. You'll be given a stock microcentrifuge tube, and you'll be given an unknown microcentrifuge tube. I'm gonna label this stock, and unk for unknown. So my unknown sample, well, my stock is going to be 10 micrograms per microliter. My Bradford volume for every single trial in this table is going to be the exact same. My protein volume. So what volume am I going to take from my cuvette or from my microcentrifuge tube and add to my cuvette? This is something where people have a tendency to say, I'm going to do serial dilutions. Because of the subtle difference in protein concentrations between samples, what I recommend is to have very, very minor differences in protein volume. So what I mean by that is trial number one will be 900 microliters of the Bradford and 100 microliters of protein volume or of the stock protein. Trial number two will be 900 microliters of the Bradford, but then it will also be 95 microliters of that stock. Okay. Now, in order to deal with that, what you need to do is you need to have a uniform volume. So nine, if, if we look at trial number one, that was 900 microliters of the Bradford and 100 microliters of the protein. That was 1,000 microliters. Trial two is 900 microliters of Bradford and 95 microliters of the protein. So what do we have to add? We have to add five microliters of DH2O. Trial number three, we're going to continue decreasing our protein volume ever so slightly. So trial three will be 90 microliters of the protein plus 10 microliters of water. Trial four will be 85 plus 15, so it's plus 10. Now, 
I recommend this because generally people will do uh um they'll do serial dilutions and if you do one to ten serial dilutions what you notice is by like the fourth sample your absorbance is either registering at zero or it's negative and your protein concentration there is extremely low now i like to do it this way and you're welcome to play around with these numbers however you see fit um but the reason that I like to do it this way is because my protein concentration in sample number one is 10, 10 micrograms per microliter, because this right here is taken directly from my stock. The total volume for the protein fraction is 100 microliters. So if you were to do a C1V1 equals C2V2 calculation, which I'm going to do right here, is... C1V1 equals C2V2. My initial concentration, this is for trial number one. My initial concentration was 10. My initial volume was, well, I took 100 microliters of it right here, and I set that equal to C2V2. Well, C2 is what I'm solving for, so I'm going to put an X there. My volume two, what is the volume? of my protein fraction and what I the reason that I'm defining my protein fraction is because I have a fixed Bradford volume I have a fixed volume that relates to my protein and so what that's going to be is 100 my v2 whenever I'm doing this calculation will always be 100 because the protein fraction will be 100 microliters Okay, so that would be one, and then if you do divide each side by 100, cancel, cancel, we're left with 10 micrograms per microliter. Now, if I were to instead say 10, oh, wait, my initial concentration is 10, and I got, um, let's say, 85 microliters. So this is the calculation for trial number four. Well, 10 times 85 is going to be 850. And that is equal to X times 100 divided by 100 divided by 100. X equals 8.5. So my protein concentration is 8.5. So with this sort of calculation scheme, what I'm doing is very gradually decreasing my concentration. I'm very gradually seeing from trial to trial to trial, my concentration decline. Now, what that means is if we look at, let's say, put in some hypothetical values here, 9.5, 9.0. Well, these would be actual values for those calculations. UG for UL, UG for UL, UG for UL. Absorbance. Let's say, here's my hypothetical numbers. 0 0.952, 0 0.741, then 0 0.722, 0 0.710. Okay. There's a pretty stark drop off between 10 micrograms and 9. 0.5 micrograms per microliter, um, a drop off of, well, 0.952 to 0.741. One thing that I would recognize about those number differences is that's not a linear relationship if I look at all of my data, because whenever I'm decreasing by half a microgram per microliter for my other samples, my change is very gradual. So what I'm focused on, what I want to see is I want to see a linear relationship with my data. Now, with that in mind, Let's say that you did an unknown sample and you got an absorbance of 0 0.719. If you had an unknown absorbance of 0 0.719, what would you be able to do with that? Well, the great thing is we're relating concentration of a known sample and absorbance to one another. If you get an unknown sample, you do not know the concentration of that unknown protein sample but you do have the absorbance, 0.719.
do you have a data set or data points that you can relate that to? You absolutely do. That Those data points end up within that range. So that unknown protein sample, you'd be able to say, well, the concentration is greater than 8.5. The concentration is less than 9.0. This would be a very powerful sort of calculation that you can do and kind of clear things or kind of watch these very gradual changes and how they very gradual changes in concentration lead to also some gradual changes in absorbance. Now, the value of that is all going back to, to think about Gen Chem 1 sort of stuff, accuracy and precision. You're very precise. You're very precise by having a narrow range of absorbances in which to calculate. Now, with that in mind, um, this data sheet, if you'll notice, has a very good number of samples to analyze. You do not have to fill that data set up. Um, you're going to use a graphing program. This is something you probably want to do on your own time using Excel. And then you're also going to have an unknown sample. That unknown sample, if you look at the bottom here, what you're going to be able to do is take that sample with the unknown protein concentration and plug it in. Bradford and unknown protein volume, 900 and 100. Determine the absorbance of that. Do it a total of five times because you want this number to be very reliable. You want to be able to trust that amount. Then whenever you work with that, you can calculate your absorbance. You can ultimately come up with a concentration of that unknown protein sample. Um, then there's some follow-up questions here that ask you how to like, you know, just think about the Bradford region, look at that molecule, look at your data. And that's one thing that I want you to take away from this. The data that you put together, the conclusion of your unknown, well, that is yours because that was something that you made all the samples. Um, and I want you to become more comfortable and more proficient at this technique so that at the end of the semester, you know how to do it and you can do it very well and very easily um, because this ultimately is your practical final exam. And so I want you to be yeah, comfortable with this technique, practice it over the course of the semester. You will get better and better and better. Other than that, though, I hope you have a wonderful afternoon and have a good day.